Okay. So, um, I was kind of surprised that so many people use COSO outside the SOX arena. I guess in banking, we're just so used to seeing the COSO model being used for SOX. So, we may have a little conversation if you guys are willing um, about how you use it elsewhere. We have that in the slides. But certainly, um, in the SOX environment, we only use COSO for financial uh, objectives. So, you know, is the financial reporting, um, you know, is it the same? You know, is it reliable? Is it, you know, telling people what they need to know? That kind of thing. So certainly changes in the business and operating environments um, are being considered. And operation and reporting objectives have been expanded. So I know when um, SOX first came out, when we were doing it at our bank, and it was so financially reporting driven, you know, we had this conversation, what happened to operations? Because, you know, there's some operational control, but there's not a big, fun there's not a big focus on that. And so, but certainly what happens in operation drives everything that happens in the financial reporting side. So it seemed to me there was a huge gap that we didn't uh, consider operations or even compliance um, in that financial reporting situation. <coughs> so um, what else has changed is um, the fundamental concepts underlying the five components, um, you know, the control environment, information communication, that type of thing. Um, that's been broken down into um, principles. Um, and so that's kind of a help to help guide you through those, those five components. Um, and then the new guidance has given us additional approaches and examples related to some of the things that I was referring to. The operations, the compliance, and certainly non-financial reporting objectives and that type of thing. So this is the five components that I was talking about. So this has the principles. So um, as we were talking about before, the control environment used to be at the bottom of that cube. And we kind of did all this stuff, and then we got down, and then here was the control environment. But now, um, you know, the tone of the top is kind of that buzzword that you're hearing constantly. And so the control environment is now at the top, and we want that to drive all of the other pieces. But in the past, um, the control environment and control <coughs> activities may have gotten the... Um, the focus may have been on those two sections, and we're really talking about integrating the five of these now. So these principles help us to determine, are we complying in each of these areas? And so the COSA model, to comply with the COSA model, you actually have to have all five of these components, as well as um, comply with the, the principles that underlie them. So we have the, the principles, and then in the new model, what they've done is they've broken those principles down, and there are 77 points of focus. And um, so the 77 <coughs> points of focus are used to help, to help us as a guidepost to say, are the principles functioning? So, um, so that's the, these are new in, in the guidance. So those 17 are kind of broken down further to help us provide a little bit more guidance. So on the, specifically on the points of focus, um, they're not required. Your team would kind of look at the points of focus for each of the 17 principles and say, okay, does this, is this relevant to my entity, to this um, operation, or what have you? And then you decide whether it's suitable and whether you're going to apply it or not. Um, it can help you to understand the respective principles. So the questions come up, and you look at the points of focus, and then you can say, does, does this help us in determining whether we are complying with the principle itself? But we're not required to separately assess whether or not they're in place. So it's not like you have, there's 77 of these, so it's not like you have to take and break down all 77 of them and say, okay, yes, this is in place, or this isn't, isn't in place. So... Um, so, and then simply, and at the end, they're simply enablers. I didn't like this, I don't like this word. I mean, to me, it makes me think of an alcoholic, but anyway. Um, but they're not required in order to have an effective system of control. So I guess you could 
not having a neighbor but still be an alcoholic. So it's the same thing with the points of hope. This is probably not the best analogy, but that's what came to mind. You probably remember that now. So. Okay, so here's an example of the points of focus. So this is um, in the tone at the top piece. The organization demonstrates a commitment to integrity and ethical values. So it has these four supporting points, points of focus. Uh, sets the tone at the top, establishes standards of con conduct, evaluates adherence to standards of contract, conduct, and then addresses deviations in a timely manner. So these four relate to that one um, principle. So when you're going through this, you can look through, okay, you know, do we set the tone at the top? That might be, um, that might be relevant to yours. Um, so establishes standards of conduct. Conduct. This might be, you know, in our mind, this might be a formal standard of conduct policy or procedure. And in some of your larger organizations, and I think you're seeing that kind of trickle down in most organizations now, but say you're a smaller company and, you know, you have have people know what the standard conduct is, but it's not actually a written formal procedure. You know, that's kind of an example of what we're looking at here. So you might not have to um, have each of these individually, depending on the organization, but they help you to look at the principle and say, you know, do, is that working or isn't it working? 